So, this guy is back, Michael blows Stamets off the ship, and Star Trek once again shows us that committing to an ideal doesn't require sacrifice or deals with the devil. Stick around as we review Star Trek, episode 800. Now if this is your first contact with us, welcome aboard. My name's Carl Bromley and this is the Trekkie's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay then, Star Trek Discovery Season 3, Episode 12, There Is a Tide, written by Kenneth Lynn and directed by Trek veteran Jonathan Frakes. Now, I found this quite an interesting episode. In many ways, it doesn't play out as I expected, but this time, I for one found that to be a good thing. After last week's episode with Osiris' takeover of Discovery and the opening scene in which we see her tricking her way inside Federation headquarters, I was honestly expecting to see a big firefight similar to those we've seen in previous Discovery seasons. But I was pleasantly surprised by what actually happened. Once inside FHQ's shields, instead of opening fire and trying to take advantage of the opportunity, Osiris' plan is to try and broker peace between the Emerald Chain and the Federation. Didn't see that one coming. Osira beams over after having released the crew of Discovery, barring the bridge crew, as a show of good faith. And the following exchanges between Vance and Osira are very interesting, especially the opening where it's made quite clear by Vance that he will take whatever action is necessary to maintain security during Osira's visit. I did, however, find it interesting that when Osira asks where the president is, Vance simply says that he's been authorised by the President to act on their behalf in negotiations for the safe return of Discovery. And it made a thought pop into my head about the Federation and indeed who is the President. But I think we might do a live discussion on that one so be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications so that you don't miss out on that. Now thanks to the Starfleet lie detector hollow Eli we surprisingly find out that Osira is genuinely telling the truth about the desire for peace. She wants to form a new federation, and in this moment, she almost seems envious of the federation. Well, other than the fact that she gets to eat real apples and the federation ones are basically made of shit. <coughs> you see, despite all the resources that the Emerald Chain has at its disposal, including, we find out, some of the best scientific research facilities in the galaxy, the way they have forged their empire has left them lacking in an area that the Federation still symbolises. Hope. And I think it shows what may become Osiris' Achilles heel. You see, for all the power she has, and the fear she inspires in others, the one thing she seems to crave is love and acknowledgement for what she sees as her achievements. When speaking with Aurelio in engineering about figuring out how Stamets pilots the spore drive, Osiris' expressions while he's describing how he believes the galaxy is a better place because of her are those of satisfaction and almost relief that at least someone can understand what she is trying to do. And however genuinely he believes what he is saying at that point, he has only seen the side of Osira that she wants him to see, enabling her to portray herself in the image of Galaxy's benevolent saviour. Unfortunately, despite all the concessions that she is willing to make, including the abolition of slavery, withdrawal from worlds such as Book's home planet of Quajon, and no more violations of the Federation's prime directive, which even Vance admits is impressive, there is one last stumbling block that they are not able to overcome, and that is Osira answering for her past crimes. Vance points out that in order to make this alliance possible, she must appoint someone who would represent the chain completely independently of her, and be willing to put her on trial for her well-documented crimes. You see, as much as I've been dubious about Vance so far this season, and whether he's hiding something, his moral compass is clearly holding true. And he explains himself in this moment, pointing out to Osira that the burn 
left the Federation with a legacy of fear, isolation and scarcity. And these legacies can often cloud people's moral clarity. A clarity that he fights for on a daily basis and asks his people to die for. So if she is not willing to stand true to the same ideals and morals, and that that is the reason that an agreement can't be reached, then Vance can sleep with a clear conscience. And this is a great lesson for all of us here, when so many people are in the same position as the Federation and are facing those very same hardships of isolation, scarcity and fear over the uncertainty of what the future holds. If there's one thing we can hold on to and take strength from, it's the ability to make the right choice and stand up for what we believe in. So I for one say, nice one Admiral, and thank you. Thank you for reminding us that if in order to achieve a goal, it means us compromising our moral ground and principles, then we need to look for a different path. Now this episode does contain more raw emotional scenes that we're going to discuss later, namely what's going on with Stamets and Burnham. But for now, let's lighten it up slightly by focusing on the bridge crew for a moment. Well, you remember the bad guy cowboy, um, I mean courier from episode two that got sent out into the parasitic ice never to be seen again. Well, he's back and helping Asira with the takeover and control of Discovery. And I don't mind that he's back. All right, he's not the most menacing of characters, and he's blatantly just gone running to Asira, crying after episode two. And rightly so, the crew aren't really that scared of him. Let's face it, he's just a bully that was put down, so went off and got help from a bigger bully. He's not really much more than a disposable henchman. Although... His quip to Tilly did make me chuckle, saying that they'd managed to take over Discovery in 12 minutes, but that under lesser leadership it probably would have only taken 10. I'm not the biggest fan of her being made acting first officer. Nothing against the character or the actor, I just don't think it was realistic. Anyway, the crew go for the classic distract the guards by arguing amongst themselves, then catch them off guard and strike. Just like we did in episode 17, you scene-stealing hack. Sorry, sorry. Got my fandoms crossed there for a moment. So the bridge crew manage to get free and make their way to the armory, where they grab as many phases as they can carry and prepare to storm the bridge and retake the ship. Buck and Rin stay behind to buy them some time. Now armed to the teeth, ready for their heroic actions, their acting captain gives the order to leave anyone who doesn't make it behind. Really? Did Tilly not listen to Captain Pike either? I've already been over this in an earlier review. Wasn't anyone listening? Now, remember in my last review, where I was a little annoyed that the sphere data was nowhere to be seen when Discovery was taken over? Well, it's back, and ready to play its part, and I think it's a fun idea to have it controlling the Dock 23s to help the crew retake control of the ship. Those repair bots are all over the place and should come in very handy. And I like the way that the Dock 23s seem to have a personality and are a little timid when approaching the crew. The sphere data is here to help, but it's obvious that violence isn't its thing. I think the docks actually come across as quite cute, and I'd like to see them provide maybe a little comic relief. Considering the sphere data's interest in classic comedies, and I like the fact that the AI is now openly talking to the crew. I think it's going to make some interesting storylines for season four. Okay, let's head back to those emotionally intense moments I mentioned. We're in engineering and Stamets is being questioned by Aurelio about his connection to the spore drive. Stamets is trying to make a connection with him, spotting the piercings behind his ear which represent each of his children. Stamets explains that he has a child, obviously referring to Adira and how he now feels about them. Stamets also uses this opportunity to try and tell Aurelio about the other side of Asira, the tropes of her personality that she hides away from him and how some of the scientific research he's been involved with has been used for less than morally credible actions. 
And although Aurelio continues to defend Osira, the seed of doubt is planted. And when Osira returns to Discovery and that seed is given chance to flourish, when Aurelio witnesses her dispatch Rin without a moment's hesitation, poor Rin. So this could well end up being another nail in the coffin for Osira, as Aurelio will surely come to his senses and help the crew. Now, thinking of Stamets, he's having a bit of a bad few episodes, isn't he? First, he gets slapped with a mind control device, which forces him to work the spore drive for Osira against his will. And now Michael not only forces him off Discovery, she traps him in a kind of escape pod force field type thing after explaining to him that everyone he cares about is trapped in the Veruban Nebula and then knocking him out with a Vulcan nerve pinch. Anthony Rapp plays this scene brilliantly. The absolute raw emotion coming from Stamets is pure desperation, and I really felt for him here. His reasoning to Michael is absolutely valid. These people that she's seemingly willing to sacrifice gave up everything they loved by travelling to the future with her. That's how important she is to them. Now, I understand that this is the completion to her character arc with regards to what happened in Season 2 with Arium, especially since that's already been highlighted this season by Vance when he questioned her ability to make difficult choices. But it just feels like that very important lesson of never leaving someone behind is once again just being put aside. And another thing that Vance pointed out a few episodes ago was about doing everything you can for a crew member in need. Otherwise, you and your crew will never be able to look at you the same way again. But I don't want to place blame for the whole situation that Michael now finds herself in on her shoulders. Some of that blame has to go to Stamets. Why, I hear you ask? Well, let me explain. Back in episode three of the season, which was one of my favourites this season, Saru specifically instructs Stamets to investigate alternative ways of piloting the spore drive without it needing him, in case he once again became incapacitated. Initially, Stamets didn't want to know, and that seemed to be in no small part down to his ego and his need to be central to his own invention. But considering how the characters evolved during this season and how much more is at stake for him personally, and indeed the implications for the Federation should they find a way of working the spore drive without him, I'd have thought he would have been well underway with that research. And if in fact he'd have followed his captain's orders and maybe even succeeded, then he wouldn't be in the position he is now. And at least on a subconscious level, the knowledge of this would be adding to the desperate anguish that he's now going through. So it isn't all Michael's faults when you think about it? Okay, so now it's time to rate this episode. Well, it's definitely better than last week's. Overall, I found it to be enjoyable. The overall pace of the episode is perfect, from the intense opening scene where Osira is infiltrating Federation HQ while Buck and Burn and Crash Book ship into the shuttle bay, to the negotiation table between Vance and Osira. It was great to see the slipstreams full of debris, giving us a, a visual explanation of why people must be crazy to use the courier network. And I think it ties in with a comment made by Book at the start of the season about the Gorn's experiments damaging subspace, which is presumably what caused all these destroyed ships to be in the slipstreams. So it was nice to get that tie in, even if it's just for a moment, so that we actually see why they don't get used. I think the whole Osira wanting peace was a real curveball that I didn't see coming. And the scenes between her and Vance were outstanding. Credit to both Oded Farah and Janet Kidder for stealing the episode with those. It was great to see Vance truly defining his character's position once and for all as well. And I think the way Osira is becoming more than just a moustache twirling villain is fantastic. Now, we didn't see anything about what was happening back at the Veruban Nebula with Saru, Culber, Adira and Sukal. This whole episode focuses on subjects where the only relation to the season's main story is how the two great societies of the galaxy were impacted by the burn. But you know what? On this occasion, 
I didn't mind not getting any more answers after what I thought was a very lacklustre episode last week. This one, on the other hand, as I'd hoped, has raised the game leading into the finale. I feel like the more I watch this episode, the more I'm going to take from it, and that, to me, is the hallmark of a great Star Trek episode. So, as much as it's not my favourite episode of the season, I would put it up there in my top five, and therefore, I'm going to give Star Trek Discovery Season 3, Episode 12, There Is a Tide, a Warp Factor rating of 8. Well, thanks for watching, folks. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, please smash the like button for us. I'd love to hear what your thoughts on the episode are, so drop those down in the comments below and let's discuss. Don't forget, if you haven't done so already, we'd love you to consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell for notifications so that you never miss a video. Remember, we'll be live this Sunday at 9pm UK time with our friends from the USS Rikers Beard for our usual instalment of news, banter and general Trek-related fun in Let's Talk Trek, so be sure you're subscribed for that. But for now... Set a course for Star Trek Discovery Season 3's finale, Warp 8, Engage.